great, great God. And thank you, God, because today you have promised to supply our needs. You've promised to make a way where there seemed to be no way. You promised to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And we give you the glory and praise and honor for your awesome presence here right now. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing, even in this moment. But thank you, God, for changed lives, and thank you for transformation, and thank you for a breakthrough beginning today in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As you're seated, smile at somebody and say, my God can. My God can. You can turn with me this morning to the 78th division of the book of Psalms, Psalm 78. And while you're doing that, I want to welcome everybody who has joined us uh, this morning over Victory Live. We're so glad that you are uh, with us in our worship today. And uh, you can turn with us as well to the book of Psalms. And I'm reading Psalm 78. And I'll begin reading with verse 19. The Bible says, Yea, they spake against God. I don't want to speak against God. They spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. God was angry. Why was God angry? If you look at verse 31, it says, The wrath of God came upon them, and it said it slew the fattest of them. I, I don't think that means what it means now, but if it does, everybody's going to go on a diet starting Monday. But I think he was talking about the healthiest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. So God was angry with them. Why? Because they had seen so much. God delivered them from a land of slavery. They had been bound for 450 years when God sent Moses. And God brought them out of Egypt and then they got to the Red Sea. There was no way to cross it. And God opened up the Red Sea and the Bible says they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. They had to wander in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Did you know it was only a three-week hike from Egypt to the Promised Land? And the reason they wandered for 40 years is because it only took one night to get them out of Egypt, but 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And so they wandered in the wilderness because of their un unbelief. And during that time, God provided for them. He gave them clothes that never wore out. And apparently, the clothes grew with their children. He gave them manna from heaven. And when they got sick and tired of eating ambrosia, heavenly manna, they said, we want meat, and God sent quail. When they got thirsty, God had water gush out of a rock. And it not only slaked their thirst, but they were able to satisfy the thirst of all of their flocks and their cattle. Time after time after time, God performed miracle after miracle. And now they're questioning God and they're asking can God? Well, I, I've come by today to tell you God can. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God can. God can. There's just nothing that's impossible with God. I believe that God has all power. Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Psalm 611, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Luke 1, 37, For with God nothing 
shall be impossible. And yet, I believe that people miss out on the miracles of God because they don't understand the purpose of miracles. There are three reasons why God performs miracles. Are you ready? Write this down somewhere. Number one is compassion. Everybody say compassion. Turn with me in your Bible to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, and look at verse 14. Matthew 14 and 14. The Bible says that Jesus saw a great multitude, and the Bible says that he went forth and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Turn with me over to the 20th chapter of Matthew. And let's look at it again. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 34. Two men who were blind said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Now the crowd tried to get them to um, be quiet. But they cried even louder. Son of David, have mercy on us. And the Bible says, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Why did he do it? Because he had compassion on them. I want you to turn now to the book of Mark, the first chapter. Mark chapter 1 and look at verse 41. There was a man who had leprosy. Leprosy, as I've said many times, is a horrible disease because it's like cancer that's contagious. When a person had leprosy in Jesus' day, they were sent away from polite society. They were banned from the synagogue and from the temple. They were not allowed to go to work. They were not allowed to remain in their homes. Most of them ended up in the cemetery. They lived among the dead, waiting for the time when they would die. And then someone told this man about Jesus. And they said to him, if you can ever get to Jesus, he heals leprosy. He raises the dead. He is a miracle worker. And this man exemplifies everything about us that keeps us from receiving a miracle. Did you know that everybody in this room and probably everyone listening to me is fully convinced that God is awesome? God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. We don't doubt that He rides the wings of the wind, that He sits upon the circle of the earth, that heaven is His throne, and the earth is His footstool, and the oceans wash back and forth in the hollow of His hand. We can see God in the red cheek of the rose and in the white dress of the lily and the majesty of a mountain. We can feel God in the cosmic rays of the sun and in the passing breeze. We can see God in the fleecy clouds floating overhead or the shining sequins in the vesture of God, the stars, because there are 60 billion in our galaxy. And yet we can't believe God for a miracle for one reason. We believe that God is great. We're just not convinced that he really cares. We're not convinced that God would take the time to see about us. We know that God is in control of the universe. We know that a flower can't bloom without God. A tree can't bud. Birds can't fly. And yet somehow we're convinced that God really doesn't care about us. How could you ever think that? 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the Bible says that if God gave his son, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Jesus was on his way to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And this man dying with leprosy confronted him and said, if you want to, you can make me whole. And listen to what the Bible says in verse 42. In verse 41, Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand. Remember the man said, if you will, you can make me whole. Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. Look at Mark chapter 5. In the fifth chapter of the book of Mark, Jesus sails the treacherous sea of Galilee to bring deliverance to a poor, pitiful man who was demon-possessed. In fact, he was in such a horrible plight that he cried day and night. Today they have people, young people especially, they call cutters, and they cut themselves, and the psychiatrists say they do it because of self-loathing or because they just want to feel alive. But this man was cutting himself with sharp stones. He was the first cutter. He was tormented. Jesus said to him, what is your name? And the demons began to speak through him and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. 6,000 demons in one man. Now watch what happened. Jesus cast those demons out and then Jesus said to the man in verse 19, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. I want to make something perfectly clear. God loves you. You say, I've given him a thousand reasons not to love me. I know, and not one of them is good enough. He still loves you. He has compassion on us when we are hurting. The Bible said the Lord is near to those whose hearts are breaking. The Bible says he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Some of you cry at night. You think nobody cares, nobody understands. Your heart's broken. Some of you are struggling with depression. Some of you are struggling with bitterness. Some of you have problems in your home, your family, your companion. Nobody understands, nobody cares, but Jesus cares. And when you cry out to him, he always hears your prayer. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And when you call out to him, God hears you. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jesus said, you shall seek me and find me when you call on me because it is the Father's good pleasure to give Give you the kingdom. Hallelujah. He said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. What is the guarantee that God will hear and answer your prayer? He loves you. Amen. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God loves you. God loves you. So number one, compassion. Here's the second reason. Confirmation. Everybody say confirmation. Jesus always confirmed his word by miracles. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he opens a blind man's eyes. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And then he raises a man from the dead. Jesus said, I am the water of life. And he gives to a poor, pitiful woman who's been married five times and shacking up with her boyfriend, living water to quench the thirst of her suffering 
soul. Jesus always put truth on display. And I want you to know something. This is truth. We have right now a controversy brewing over what happened two and a half years ago with the CDC. If you've been watching the news at all, and uh, I don't, I don't want to say I told you so, but I told you so. They said, well, we just came up with that six foot. You know, when we said keep six feet, this, this is what we, we didn't know what we we're talking about. Uh, I always thought that was kind of fishy. Does a virus know that like, okay, I'm going to get you up. Oh, I can't, I've, I've run six feet now. I can't go seven feet. I'm just, I can only go six feet. And then they said, well, you know, we told you about those masks. Of course, we knew at the time that the holes you were breathing through were 300 times bigger than the virus, but it made you feel better to wear a mask. So we said, everybody wear a mask. Then we said, everybody wear two masks. And now they're trying to make children who are the least vulnerable in New York and in, in Washington, D.C., you must wear a mask to go back to school. If you think that your mask is going to keep you from giving, getting COVID, I think you could be talked into building a, 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 a fence uh, to keep out mosquitoes. Because really, it, you know, it, it, a chain link fence won't keep out mosquitoes. Now you say, are oh, you going to get mad at me again? I never was mad at you the first time. You were mad at me, remember? Because you thought I was going to turn this church into a place where everybody would get sick and die. The truth of the matter is, if we go back, and hindsight is 2020. But if you go back, I don't believe one person less would have died if we had just used some common sense and said, wash your hands and be careful, but don't close the business, don't ruin the economy, don't close churches down. For every nine churches that closed, only five reopened. Our church today is about half the attendance it was pre-COVID. And we've had a lot of other uh, uh, contributing factors, things that have happened in the last two and a half years. But folks, there's, there's some people that are still afraid of COVID. A man yesterday, uh, last week told me, he said last Sunday was going to be their first Sunday back after two and a half years. He said, they're going to let me preach, but we've been out for two and a half years. We closed the doors and did not reopen, didn't have any personal gatherings. Nobody came together for two and a half years. Don't you know the devil was laughing at us the whole time? And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what they're talking about. It could be monkey pox. I don't know what they're going to come up with next. But you can tell, you, you, you can tell everybody this for me. Don't ever worry about this church closing its doors ever again. We won't go in the parking lot. We don't, and somebody said, well, bless God, I won't show up. Well, I'm just telling you now, before I'll close the doors of this church, you'll see me doing the perp walk on the 6 o'clock news because I'm not going to do it because it was an attempt to see who they could shut down. And guess what? It worked. I said it worked and I'm ashamed of it. And people of faith and people that had the answer and people that had the truth were willing to say we're non-essential. It was a, an opportunity for us to say, no, we are essential. If you got to keep the ABC stores open, if you got to keep the strip clubs open, you need to keep the church open because people need Jesus. People need to hear the word of God. The word of God is truth. Everything has to line up with the word of God. Nowadays, you hear people talking like, well, it's my truth. There's no such thing as my truth. I said, there's no such thing as your truth. Well, you see, I was born a male, but my truth is that I'm really a female. No, your truth is that you're crazy. Amen. Amen. Well, you know what? I don't know. I've always been attracted to men, so I guess I'm a homosexual, and I guess I got to live that sick and sorry lifestyle. Listen, folks, it's time for us to go back to the truth. Jesus said when he was talking to the Father, and we got a chance to eavesdrop on it in John 17, he said, thy word is truth. People said, follow the science, follow the science. They weren't even following the science because the science will line up with the word of God. 
And anyway, no matter what comes down the pike, we still have the promise that Jehovah Rapha is the Lord God who heals us and makes our bitter experiences sweet. I'm not saying we're not vulnerable. I'm not saying we're not tabernacle in flesh. I'm not saying that we can't get some kind of disease or a virus. What I am saying is this, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And if we'll keep trusting in God and believe in God, God will confirm his word with miracles. Hallelujah. So one of the reasons why God performs miracles is confirmation. If you look at Hebrews, the second chapter, it says we ought to give the more earnesty. Now watch, to the things that we have heard. Not something new. Something we have heard. This is what we have heard. We ought to give the more earnesty to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let it slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. The way God confirms his word is through miracles. It's about confirmation. Isaiah 55, 10, 11, for as the rain cometh down, the snow from heaven, it turneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish which, that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And in Romans 1, 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Watch, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And that word salvation doesn't just mean the salvation of your soul. It means healing, and it means deliverance and it means soundness. We are people of the word. We are people of the spirit. We are people of faith. And while the world was running scared, we said, oh yeah, we'll join in with you and we'll run. Which way should we run? We should have stood on this word and said, God is greater than any enemy that comes against us. If he comes against us one way, he'll flee from us seven ways and every tongue that rises up against us and judgment shall be condemned. Hallelujah. And that's the end of my rant. Psalm 107 and 20 says, He sent His word and healed them. Listen to Proverbs 4, verses 20 through 22. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine heart and my, uh, unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. God has ordained miracles to accompany the preaching of the word. Jesus stood up in the synagogue in Luke 4, 18. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, and to set the captives free. God will confirm his word again with wonders and miracles in these last days. How many of you believe that? Say amen. amen. Which brings me to the last point. The first is compassion. The second is confirmation. But why would God perform miracles? Confrontation. Most of us don't like confrontation. I'm not a big fan of it either. I don't like to fight with people. That's not me. It's not my nature. But there are times when we have to stand up and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God and say, I'm not running away. I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to make sure I'm standing on the word of God. Somebody told Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, said, you know, God is on our side. We will prevail. And Abraham Lincoln said to them, I'm not so concerned about God being on our side. I want to be on his side. And sometimes we want God to come and see about us because we've got some agenda and we want God to do what we want God to do. If you can find out what God says and stand flat-footed on it and not move, God will work in your behalf and he will confront your enemies and he'll use miracles to do it. Let me show what I'm talking about. Confrontation is spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6 and 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. The most powerful of all spiritual weapons is the miraculous power of God. 
Jesus confronted the devil with his miracles. When Jesus was accused of casting out devils by Beelzebub, he said in John 10, 38, if you don't believe in me, believe for the works or miracles that I do, that ye may know and believe that I am, the, I, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the Bible states, many of the Jews which had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him, John eleven forty five. 45. It's time for the church to confront the devil. I watched CNN recently, I'm ashamed to say. And I watched the Pope welcome a Muslim holy man and a Buddhist monk to the Vatican. You say, well, that's in Rome. The Anglican Church of the Church of England, located its headquarters in London, Westminster Abbey, recently opened its doors to a Muslim who prayed to Allah and said, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. A Buddhist stood before the congregation and spoke on the spiritual value of meditation. You say, oh, it's in England. Recently, the World Council of Churches here in the United States declared, and I quote, that all prayers to deities should be accepted and not just those directed to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't know much about the council of churches, but I know that Jesus said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I pray that the church will find its backbone and confront this spirit of religion that tries to take the God out of Christ. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Oprah says there are many ways to God, and Jesus says, I am the way. There may be many ways to Christ, but there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. In Acts 10, 43, it says to him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. In John chapter one, verse 11, he came unto his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In John 20 and 31, he said, but these were written that ye might believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that believing you might have alive through his name. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus is the only way. Somebody say amen. The miracles of the Old Testament simply prove that the Lord is God. That's what the miracles of Egypt were about. You know, there were uh, the, the Egyptians were uh, uh, polytheistic. They worshipped many gods. One of those gods was the frog god. And so God said, I'll have a little fun. And he caused frogs to fill the land. I mean... At night, their sheets were hopping because there were frogs in there. They went to the dough bowls and uh, the, the kneading trays, and frogs were in the dough. Everywhere they went, there were frogs. They got to the place they hated frogs. And I guess you could say the frog God croaked. And God proved I'm greater than all of these idols and these so-called gods. Seventy times in Ezekiel when talking about miracles, God said that they shall know that I am the Lord. The, miracle in the book of Dan miracles in the book of Daniel were about the same thing. It is time for the church of the 21st century to, con to confront the false gods or demons I'm going to preach this a little bit now. And if, if, if what I'm saying is making you mad, you need to get saved. I'm just giving you a, a warning. We have tried to cozy up to this world. And we do much better at reflecting the culture around us than we do the Christ within us. 
There are people who say, you know what, when you start talking about gays, man, it, I just I get all jittery and I'm wondering if somebody's going to be hurt. You know what I wonder? I wonder if there's somebody that's bound by that lifestyle that comes in here and doesn't think they can get free. So they come in here and they know they're miserable and they know it's sick and they know it's sorry and they really want to get free because there's never been a sinner that didn't know he was a prisoner to sin. And they come in here and instead of confronting sin and instead of confronting the demons of the 21st century, we say, it's okay. Everybody just join hands and sing Kumbaya. It's going to be all right. God loves you just like you are. He may love you just like you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. And that's not just homosexuals. If you are a serial fornicator, if you are an adulterer, if you're guilty of any kind of sexual sin, I got good news for you. God can set you free. And whom the Son has made free, he is free indeed. And every time you see somebody set free from that kind of lifestyle, it's a miracle. And we can point to it and say, look at our God. You know, for years, ever since uh, 9-11, I've been pretty much ticked off at Muslims. I really have. I see them and I think, what are they doing in our country? They're responsible for over 3,000 deaths on 9-11. Until, until God opened my eyes. Until there was a man by the name of John who came here and preached for us and said, I was a Muslim. My wife, Rachel, was a Muslim. God saved us and filled us with the Holy Ghost. And we're leading a revival in the Islamic state of Pakistan. It's still against the law for people to be converted to Christianity. And yet hundreds of thousands of people are coming to Jesus Christ. John and Rachel Javid came here and we gave them this pulpit and on a Wednesday night, they raised $10,000. You know what it was for? To bus people into a remote location, a big open field. And I remember speaking to that group on Zoom. Huge screen was set up, and I preached to them. I preached from Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Not only could they see me, but I could look out and see them. Fifty thousand people in one place. And Johnny, they were Muslims. There weren't Christians there. There weren't Baptists there. There weren't Catholics there. There weren't Church of God folks there. There weren't Assembly of God folks. They were Muslim and they would hang on every word. And when I gave an invitation and I said, if you want Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life as your Savior and Lord, I want you to come forward and 30 thousand by actual count receive Christ into their hearts. That is a miracle. We've confronted the demon of religion and said Jesus is Lord. Go ahead and do what you will. Go ahead with your jihad. Go ahead and be a terrorist. Go ahead and kill people that are innocent. But in the end, Jesus Christ is Lord and he can change your life and transform your life. And for the one time in your life, you'll know there is a Savior and his name is Jesus. Somebody help me praise God. Enough people were saved in that meeting. They said, we want to start a church. And I began to write people I knew, and I just mentioned it. I never received an offering here from this pulpit, but I told people that I knew. And we received almost $20,000 so that they could take a building and renovate it. And in just a few months, they will be in the church, and it's called Victory Tabernacle in Pakistan. Hallelujah. It's a miracle, and we are confronting demons in the 21st century. Somebody say, praise God. I looked in the back of this book, and I found out what happens. We win. I said, we win. How do I know that? Listen to what the Bible says. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. And Satan was de who deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength and honor and the kingdom of our God 
and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Revelation 12, 9 through 11. Revelation 5 and 10 says of us, we shall be kings and priests unto our God and we shall reign on the earth. It's time for miracles. I believe that beginning today, you and I are going to see miracles of healing and deliverance. If you came in here sick, you're thinking, boy, first thing Monday morning, I'm going to my family doctor. I'm gonna find out what's wrong. I'm gonna find out what kind of wonder drug is on the market. I'm gonna find out if there's a surgery. I'm gonna find out and then I'm gonna get well. May I tell you this morning, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, the Lord of this church, the Lord of glory. And with just one touch, he can make you well. It doesn't require surgery. It doesn't require any downtime. He can heal you today. Somebody said, I'm an alcoholic. Nobody knows it, but I drink to live and I live to drink. Today, Jesus can heal you and set you free from alcoholism and you can walk out of this place delivered. I'm a drug addict. Maybe I don't buy my drugs off the street, but I'm addicted to painkillers. I'm addicted and I know that I am. I can't live a day without it. Today, I have good news for you. Jesus is a miracle worker and he can set you free from that addiction. Somebody said, I'm, I, I, I have a secret sin that nobody knows about. I keep it covered up. Nobody knows, even my best friends, my wife my, uh, doesn't know. People around me don't know. They think I'm just a happy, clappy Christian all the time, but I'm struggling with something deep inside and it makes me miserable. Today is your day for a breakthrough. Today is your day for a turnaround. Today is the day that you're going to be changed. God still performs miracles. And in these last days, we're going to see all things restored. In the early church, they saw miracles and signs and wonders. God used miracles as confirmation. God did it because of his compassion and God used miracles as a means of confronting the devil. And once again, we're going to see it come to pass in these last days. I want you to stand with me this morning. If you need a miracle today, I don't care what it is, if it's spiritual, if it's emotional, if it's physical, even if it's financial, and you need a miracle, you say, man can't do it, only God can do it, then get out of your seat right now and come down here for my prayer. Come on, come on quickly. God bless you as you come. God bless you as you come. Why don't you give them a hand while they're coming? Encourage them. Man can't do it, only God can do it. Did you know that God can change the way you feel? about something sometimes people will say you know what I've got this desire to drink I asked somebody the other day I said does it taste good they said well when I first started drinking no it was bitter I didn't like it but I've developed and acquired a taste and I thought God I want you to take that taste out of his mouth I want you to set him free from that People start out, I had an injury, and I started taking painkillers, and now I'm addicted to painkillers. You know, a doctor told me one time that if you only take a painkiller when you're in pain, you'll never be addicted, but for some reason, you're no longer in pain, you like the feeling, you take the pill. Then you get addicted, you get addicted to the feeling. God can deliver you from that. God can set you free from that. I want you to move in as close as you can so that I can reach out and touch you. I'm going to pray for you today. I want our pastors to come up here and join me. And I want our, our uh, uh, church council. Would you come up here, please, and help me? I want those of you that are full of the Holy Spirit. You're full of the Holy Spirit and faith. I don't want anybody to leave, but if you're full of the Holy Spirit and faith, I want you to come down and stand behind these and just cover them up with your faith. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
We're going to believe God to meet every need that you have in your life. I need some of our ushers to come and help us because if there are people that are slain in the spirit, I want them to know they don't have to be worried about that. Somebody will be behind them. So ushers, if you'd come and help us and assist us, I'm going to start down here on this side. I don't know what it is you need, but I do know this. You came here with a need. God is here. And now that you have met in the middle, there's about to be a miracle. If you'll believe God, if you'll believe God. Now get it out of your mind that God doesn't care. Get it out of your mind that God is not interested in you. Did you know if you were the only one to believe him, God would still do it? We got this group think going on and we've been taught this by the government that you can't just do what's good for you. It's got to be all about everybody. And if everybody succeeds, that's good. But not you, not just you. They say that selfishness and it's group thinking. Everybody gets in lockstep and we all got to, if everybody wears a mask, we'll all be well. We won't transmit it, which was a lie, which was a lie. I said it was a lie. We're going to give you a shot. You get booster shots and you'll never get it. It was a lie and they knew it was a lie when they told us. Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what, don't mess with me this morning. We've been lied to. And now they said, oh, you can't just do anything for yourself. You know, if college kids can't pay their college debt, you'll pay it. You didn't go to college, but you can pay it. We don't, somebody said, oh, they're just erasing the debt. No, they're not. They're transferring it. That's socialism. That's socialism. That's what our country's about right now. But I want you to know, this has nothing to do with politics. This has nothing to do with socialism. This has nothing to do with groupthink. You need to know God knows your name. He knows you. What was that you saying earlier? He knows my name. He knows my name. He called you by your name, Tony. He knows what you need. And he cares about you. And this is about you today. So that when I pray for you, it's about, I want to pray for the... I want to pray for the missionaries and I want to pray for my Aunt Tootie that she'll get better. And I want to pray that the, all, that, that the flowers will bloom in the spring and everybody love one another. Now, what do you need? Forget Aunt Tootie right now. What do you need? What are you up here for? What do you want? What's going on in your life? Because God cares about you and he wants to help you. And he wants. Am I doing all right here? Am I just bumping my gums? I want you to understand, it's time for miracles. Somebody said, I was just hoping that so-and-so would come. You know what will bring so-and-so in here? When people jump up out of wheelchairs, when, when blind eyes start opening, when drug addicts start getting set free, when the dregs of society come in this place that everybody hates and despises, and God turns them into decent people, and they'll say, where did you get that? And they'll say, I got it in the altar. Jesus showed up. Hallelujah. Miracles. That's a miracle. Are you ready? Father, in the name of Jesus, I want you to give everybody I lay my hands on today a miracle. A miracle. Thank you for loving them. Thank you for caring about them. Thank you because it matters to you about them. And this morning, I'm claiming miracle after miracle after miracle, spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, whatever it takes. Now I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I make myself available to you. I confess every sin. Cleanse me in the blood of Jesus. I'm opening my heart by faith to receive your best because I know that you love me and you care about me. Thank you, Father, for my miracle in Jesus' name. Now somebody praise God. Hallelujah. Come on, y'all, and help me pray. Amen. Tony, lift up your hands. Father, I need some people back here. Come on, guys, hurry quick.
Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, you know the struggle that Tony has had in his life. You know what he's been through. You know everything about him, and you love him. And in the name of Jesus, I want you to give him a breakthrough in his life right now in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody pray. Come on, somebody lift up your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, do it for Cynthia right now. Do it for Cynthia right now. Janet, come here. In the name of Jesus, receive your miracle. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. Come on, guys. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I am believing you right now for a miracle breakthrough right now in Jesus. Oh, my God, there it is. Go ahead and praise him. Father, oh, Lord, the journey has been a long one, but you're a miracle worker. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lift up your hands, big guy. Come here. Father, in the name of Jesus, give him a miracle. Whatever it is he needs, give it to him right now. Right now, right now, this very moment, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You two join hands together right now. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. You're doing, God, what only you can do. Only you can do, and that's what we need, what only you can do.
For the Lord says, I have healed your hurts. I have made a way for you where there seems to be no way. I have broken the chains that bind you. Walk in that liberty. Stand in that freedom, says the Lord, for whom the Son hath made free. 
He is free indeed. Do not confess bondage. Do not confess defeat. But declare the Lord is my strength, my high tower. The Lord is my hiding place. The Lord is my strength. And the Lord is my deliverer. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice for this is your heritage as my child, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. I want everybody to stand and come on back down here, if you will, one more time. We're going to pray. We're going to pray one more prayer. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. You know, sometimes I think one of the problems that we have is that we think that, you know, if if you prayed for me to have a financial breakthrough and, and somebody doesn't hand me 10 grand when I leave here, God didn't hear my prayer. God says, stand in it, walk in it, believe, trust me, it's done. I want you to come on down as close as you can. Let everybody who wants to come, come on. You know, some people, they always use their altar service as an excuse to leave. Well, it's done. That's why they never get anything. That's why they're never changed. They come in late, and then as soon as they begin to pray for people, I'll just slip out right now. Folks, when are we ever going to get to the place that we realize it's too late to play games anymore? It's too late to play church anymore. It's too late just to have religion. If that's all you've got, you've got to be miserable. I'm telling you, it's a time to plunge in. I mean, come on in. The water is fine. Quit wading around in this thing. Get in it. Get in it over your head. Get in it so the Holy Spirit, the flow, can take you where God wants you to go. Amen. Today, I'm going to pray for everybody here that you will walk in the liberty that you receive. If God told you you got a miracle, you got it. If I prayed for you and you believe, that's it. Whatever it is you ask God for, to do for you, God says, now it's time for you to believe. Let me show you something. I can pray for a sinner and my faith will work in his behalf. But when I pray for a believer, you have to have faith. You can't get healed outside your faith. Why? Because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh, talking about believers, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Three times in the Bible you hear these words, the just shall live by his faith. You've got to walk in faith. You've got to claim what God has done for you. If anybody asks you how you're feeling, say, glory to God, I'm healed. Anybody asks you how's things with you financially, breakthrough time, turnaround time. Anybody asks you, is your wife coming back? Absolutely. Anybody asks you, your children saved? They may be mean and run in the streets, but yes, glory to God, they are saved. Amen. I'm standing in what God says that I can have. Reach over and put your hand on somebody's shoulder now. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, right now, this very moment, I am believing you, Lord. I am believing you. And so there is no doubt in my mind. There is no doubt. I am believing you that what I've asked for you, I have. This is the confidence we have. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, then surely we have the petition that we have desired of you. Father, in Jesus' holy name, in Jesus' name we pray. And we call it done. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now look at me. Ordinarily on a Sunday morning like this, I receive members. I'm not going to do it today. I'm going to do it tonight. Now watch. Now watch. If you don't care enough about coming back tonight, you don't need to join this church. I have taken people in that didn't even come back on Sunday night or Wednesday. They just show up. If that's the way it is, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. And if you claim to know the Lord and walk with the Lord and you have no desire to be here tonight, you need to stay here and pray through. Because this is not the same service. This is not the same sermon. We're not going to hear the same songs. This is a miracle service. And if you need a miracle, or you got somebody else in your family that needs a miracle. You need to get them here. You got to rent an ambulance, rent it one way. Get them over here. We're going to pray and believe, and I'm going to tell you tonight about how it's possible. It's possible, and I'll show you from the Scripture. It's possible for you to have a miracle with your name on it, and you miss it. I don't want to miss my miracle. 
So tonight I'm going to tell you how to keep from missing your miracle. How many of you are serious about God? Let me see your hand. Turn to somebody and say, I'm serious. I ain't kidding. I'm not playing. I'm serious about God. I'm serious about living for God. And you be here tonight at 6 o'clock over in the chapel. And if you want to get baptized, we'll take care of that too. If you haven't been baptized in water, you need to get baptized. If you've been baptized and you backslid, you need to get baptized again. And that's why we got the water ready. All you got to do is show up tonight. Amen. Rodney, where's Rodney Wright? Here, come up here, Rodney. Rodney yesterday was making things look good in that chapel. We've had a situation with wall. That's another one I didn't tell you about, those beautiful stained glass windows. See, this is an old, the building's getting old, and it was about to fall through. And so we've done some repairs. We're going to have to do some more. But Rodney came in here yesterday. I saw him and painted and worked around there. I love you, man. Amen. Love you, you, too. you are great. I, I thank God for you. Amen. So dismiss us, and Don and I are going to slip out, and we're going to go back here so we can greet folks that are here for the first Amen. time. Amen. The Word of God says, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Be here tonight, 6 o'clock, miracle service. Also, don't forget tomorrow, prayer. All right? I hope to see you all. Oh, well, hope I'm going to see my mom. Sorry, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to see my mom today. So I won't see you tonight, but I'll see you tomorrow. All right? Let's do our benediction. Be complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Dismiss and have a great day.